Hello from Sydney, Australia. I'm Margaret Brandman, composer, performer and recording artist. Welcome to the podcast. Great to have you here, Margaret. I'm really pleased to be with you today. Now, you have a big, long story, so um, we're going to start out with how you first got into music, because many people may know of your name or have seen your name in educational materials, have seen you performing. You've plenty of records produced as well in albums. So I think we'll start from the very beginning. Where did your musical journey begin? Well, I, I, my mother tells me that while she was pregnant, she would go to concerts and art exhibitions, so I would already be exposed to music from the time I was practically conceived. So that's where the journey began, very yeah. early. Yeah, but and prior to that, prior to that, your family came from Berlin, I believe, around World War II. There's a big story there, and music was a very strong influence then in that home. Yes. Well, and... My grandfather's um, on his side, um, they, there was a lot of music because my grandfather was a fine tenor. This is on my father's side and also played cello. And um, the, my dad and his brother and three sisters all learnt an instrument in Germany. Um, and there was violin, cello, um, voice, piano and uh, singing. Mm -hmm. And... They used to get together for music art and for, for nighttime um, music making. And my mother's family used to go, my mother used to go along and, and join in their music art. And yeah. she met the family, A, through the music, and also she was my dad's youngest sister's best friend at school. Okay. So, <laughs> so there's a very so strong she, connection. So, but they, my dad was 13 years older than my mum. So while they were in Germany, they didn't have much to do with each other other than yeah. the families knew each other and families helped each other along. My dad's side was Jewish and my mother's wasn't. My mother's side, my grandmother on her, her side, um, actually hid my grandfather when the Kristallnacht was on, when the, we had a, the, our jewellery shop that we had in Berlin was looted. And oh my, my grandfather and, and my uncle had to flee that day. And my mother's mother uh, saw what was going on and she actually rang the Brandmans and said, you know, there's, there's, this is stuff afoot here, you know, you should go, should leave. Mm -hmm. And they went and hid at my mother's mother's place. So there was so much connection there, mm -hmm. helping the Brandmans. And one of the reasons that we got to come to Australia in the first place and they had the, the, the flee was um, in 1936 during the Berlin Games, the New South Wales Commissioner of Police, William Mackay, went to um, Berlin and he saw in the family um, shop English spoken here. So he went in and he, he bought some jewellery and my uncle, my uncle Hans, John, um, took him out for the day to show him where he could buy a special German camera. And he left his card and said, if you need me, um, he could already see that things were not really great in 1936. Yeah. And so he sponsored the family to come to Australia. And I actually still have the telegrams that were being sent backwards and forwards and, and, and a lovely letter written by my grandfather saying, you know, would you be able to help us come to Australia. So that's an amazing um, story. Yeah. So amazing those have been started. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there, there's a book coming out about this, isn't there? It's already out and the book's called Tausland. Um, mm -hmm. And it's by a Dutch author, Rita Nifpot. And she approached me and wanted to write a, about another family that I knew. And then when I told him my mother had written our whole family story, yeah. I gave her those notes and she wound two stories into a historical novel. So it's about 95% actual factual for both families, but she's wound a few touch points, as she calls it, into the book. Mm -hmm. But if you can read Dutch, it's pretty much my mum's family history. In this yeah. Book. yeah. And have you had a chance to go back and visit your, your ancestral home, as it were? Yes, I've been back to Germany several times. And I have a cousin still living in Berlin. 
and um, I have some family friends there, so I'll go and visit. And uh, it's great because I speak some German, and when I go there, they say, oh, do you speak really well, which is really nice. And uh, um, I can I understand the language. I, but it again, must be very moving. I mean, did you ever go to the, like, Outswitch to see the the remains of the camps there and so on? Did you go and see that? Um, I didn't do Auschwitz, but I went to, when I went to the Czech Republic, I went to the... Uh, Theresienstadt, I think it's called, which is another camp that they had. I went and visited that one. It's um, very difficult. But I also went back to Berlin because the, our family business uh, was in um, Münstrasse and uh, the, the building is still there. So mm -hmm. I've got pictures of me actually standing in front of the, the yeah. particular building. Yeah. And I also went to see where my grandparents' house had been mm -hmm. and it got bombed during the war, so it was no longer there. But yeah. all of that property and everything was confiscated. So the, the family came to Australia. Um, they were able to buy a first-class ticket to get out of the country. Mm -hmm. They got out early in 1939 in January, and um, they could buy a first-class ticket and bring all their furniture with them to Australia. And so they went. They flew to England and took a, the P&O boat out here, the Narkunda. And... Uh, then um, my grand, all the women in the family had the diamonds sewn into the dresses so that they could escape. Yeah, and yeah. also there was jewellery that my mum's mum baked bread, put the diamonds in the bread and they took the bread on the plane to go to. <laughs> the, the creativity of survival, you know, just surviving is a, a terrible, unthinkable situation, really. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. when you bring it forward to our current day now with Ukraine and Russia and those tensions, I mean, I've heard some people say, oh, it's happening all over again. It you is. Know? And it's it's just shocking to think that we haven't learned our lessons in a sense. Yes, exactly. So you, you just see these parallels with the Hitler times. With yeah, Putin you do, Russia. don't you? Yeah. Yes, so it's, yes. it's tough watching it. It's, it's tough watching yep. it. But going back into the musical history. So your family now is out in Australia. There's this strong musical thread going through both sides of your family. And then you're a child growing up with all this history behind you and in this musical environment. So what happens next? Well, first of all, my mother didn't marry my dad till she came to Australia. So that was 10 years after they'd left. So yeah. the brand was left in 39. My mum was actually imported as a war bride. <laughs> we had a scheme out here where you could bring people from Europe uh, to marry as long as they got married within the you know a certain, certain amount of time, time. yeah so my grandfather from here paid for her ticket to come to Australia and she was really glad to get out of Berlin because she'd lived through the war there mm -hmm. and uh, she has an exciting story where she escaped in the last six months to Switzerland with her accordion and and jumped the fence so that because they knew the Russians were coming. Yeah. So, yeah. And so my mother's side of it is really, really exciting because um, of all her survival through that time, mm -hmm. just actually mm -hmm. surviving. She mm -hmm. had to get um, her, what they we call her diploma for school. And they said to all the students, you need to work um, for the you know military and 30 of her students, classmates, were sent to Poland and worked in a munitions factory. And my mother managed to swing it to work with the Red Cross Entertainment Group and go with them to Czechoslovakia. Um, by the time she got back, the munitions factory had been bombed and all her classmates were gone except herself and one other. Yeah. So she had quite, quite the story. But she had training in Germany in accordion and piano, music theory, she had good training. So when she came to Australia to supplement the income once she married my dad, she started teaching the accordion. And so I was raised with the music all around me all day, every day. Yeah. <clears throat> and the the my little story from the age of two is that she'd be teaching and she'd ask me to put, um, you know, put me on the side of the room and she'd be teaching and I'd love toys there. But she said, I'd never watch the toys. I'd watch everything she did while yeah. she was teaching, had her eye on it. So Just I was fascinating. Learning to, be, yeah. learning to be a music teacher from age two, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and now you've awards as a, as a, you know, piano tutor, isn't that right? And you've produced yeah, a lot so of materials that we'll talk about later. 
so you move on through your childhood music is a really in your environment so strongly and would you say it was mostly classical music or was it just a mixture of genres um well because my mother was teaching the accordion which was not necessarily fully classical mm -hmm. um i was getting um folk music i was getting music of different countries french music german music um latin american because the accordion played all those different things so with the and i was I, I thought it was fantastic training because from the ear point of view with an accordion, you can't watch your left-hand buttons. And yes. you've got different major, minor, diminished, augmented, mm -hmm. uh, not augmented, uh, it's dominant set of buttons. And so you're listening all the time to sounds and more yes. aware of chords mm -hmm. than you were most of the pianists these days that in my day were not really aware of what the chords yeah, were. The, or the I harmony. suppose... The the downside of piano is, in a sense, you've always looking at sheet music and, and that can become a crutch in a sense that, you know, you're so dependent on sheet music for most people. But please continue. I'm looking at a picture actually you gave me here of a concert um, and it's like got 40. I'll show it here when people are looking at the video on YouTube, but 40 accordions on, on the stage playing all together. That must be some sound. Yes, well, this is what my mother was doing and she was coaching that many accordionists. So every year we would have the Brandon Music Studio concerts and then we grew and grew and grew and grew. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> we, you know, having 40 accordionists on the stage and uh, well-trained and playing the right notes, which was really great. Was, <laughs> I don't think you see too much of that, but uh, my mother went on to start the Accordion Society of Australia and they fostered a lot of accordion concerts and things as time went on as well. And now in your life now, do you play accordion or do you have any interest in it now? Uh, I actually ended up finding it was very heavy on the shoulder, carrying carrying the instrument. So yeah. I played it till I was about 16, 15 or 16. And uh, they were quite heavy instruments. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, I mean, piano was became my passion. So um, I just stuck with the piano and then I, at high school, I learned clarinet as well. So I had piano and clarinet going. And um, because we had the music studio as well, I we had a chance to have, dabble in guitar and uh, drum kit. I learned drums for a while. Yeah. So I thought it was great for all yeah, the Yeah, great for rhythm, I'd imagine, mm -hmm. really understanding rhythm in depth. Yeah. And, and then we did record, recorder at high school as well. <clears throat> so you yeah. got a great opportunity to explore different sounds, really. Yes, and I do. given that you have all of that experience put behind you, looking back on it now and given your wisdom of years of being in the music industry, what would you advise students to do when they're coming through their learning years of music? Would you advise a student just to focus on one instrument or do you think they should dabble if they've got a fascination across instruments? Um, well, I do just have, I'm a sample student. I've got a young lady I've been teaching since she was four, piano, but she decided to take up viola as well. So she's now doing viola and I help her I play piano for her viola and, help, and coach her um, in the musical side of it, not on the technical side. Um, but she's now going, I want to play um, ukulele and now I've got a guitar and yeah. she's doing all that herself and expanding um on her own so if you have a good foundation like the musical foundation i give with piano it's quite easy to to go into other to move ahead with yeah to move ahead with other instruments yeah. and given the years that you were studying did you do music exams throughout your years of study yes i did yeah i went right through the whole course and i ended up uh, with my um, associate degree in performing and and uh, then on i got a licentiate later on but i got um, the te teacher degree uh team us at a australia as it was called uh quite early on i think i was just 1920 when i got my teaching degree okay and very i good. had been teaching for quite a long time actually already mm -hmm. at that point yeah, so you a lot of years behind you already. And you do a special tutor, I think, a very special guy, Isidore Goodman. He is, Isidore you. Goodman. Is, Isidore Goodman. Okay, and he, he tutored you. He was my you. teacher. He was he my was your teacher. teacher. And tell us a little bit, a bit about Isidore Goodman, because he's not a name that I don't think many will be familiar with. He came from South Africa originally and came to Australia. Very fine concert pianist. Did a lot of recording with the ABC 
Um, he was well known for working when television first started. <clears throat> and uh, they would say, look, we need a um, 70 seconds of something to fill in this space from here to here. And he could play a shop end piece or uh, something from Mozart to fill in exactly that amount of space. Okay. Yeah. But I also liked, a, he was a very fine Chopin interpreter, Ravel, Bach, and he he and I clicked on, because I they're the people that I really related to, Debussy. Um, but he also oh, Debussy's played. Debussy's wonderful, oh, one of my favourites. <laughs> yeah, he played a bit of cocktail piano and, and Gershwin, of course, we, we did Gershwin together. So I thought, well, he was a bit more, of a wide thinking pianist rather than a lot of the so-called classicals in just in the box. Yes. So yeah. I related to him as my he was my final piano teacher, but I, I I I could think the same way that he did. And because I had all my chord knowledge from the accordion and then on, into piano, I was thinking chords when I was learning classical music. Okay. And he was able to, you know, think that same way that I liked, you know, doing yeah. where, where previous piano teachers would just say, looking as a G, play a G. Where is yeah. it? Oh, I'll say, oh, there's a G, I'll play that. <laughs> yeah. And the interesting thing, which we're going to talk about now in a moment, is understanding the chords that you just so beautifully referenced is fantastic for students to bring into their education because it helps for, you know, to improvise and understand the harmonies and a greater understanding of flow. So, um, very good. Join us in the next episode where you're going to be introduced to some amazing educational materials that have had breakthroughs in how students learn.